Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Seven Investing Podcast. I am Seven Investing Lead Advisor Max Chatsko, and I'm joined today by my partner in crime, Manisha Sammy. Manisha, how are you? Doing well. It's uh, exciting times for uh, healthcare and biotech. So it is. We had a little bit of a sell off today. I think that's to signal that uh, the freezing cold weather is over in the part of the country where we live. So uh, I think that's all good. Ooh. Now, we're not here to talk about the weather. Um, in fact, this is our first seven investing podcast that's going to focus solely and exclusively on biotech, whether that's genomics or proteomics or any other omics you want to throw out there. Uh, our synthetic biology. Uh, so we want to do these more regularly, maybe once every month, where we'll discuss different topics that are interesting to us. You know, we want to help you identify uh, solid investing opportunities and also identify false patterns and trends that aren't sustainable, right? To help investors avoid losing money, having pain, tears, sadness. We don't want you to have any of that. Um, so today we're going to talk about story stocks. Uh, we want to discuss the risks involved with blindly following a story or certain individuals on social media when they're talking about stocks and let that be the end of your research. That should not be the end of your research. Uh, you know, in this crazy stock market that we're in, it's a historic bull market. Valuations make no sense by historical standards, uh, but we've seen a number of distortions in how companies are valued, especially here in biotech. Uh, so, you know, in more sensible times, Manisha, if a company didn't have clinical data, it really would very rarely be worth, you know, $5 billion or $10 billion. Uh, and that's not at all what's happening now. Now, I think you and I would probably agree, you know, in the past, that was maybe not an efficient way to value uh, early stage drug developers. So yeah, a lot of things like companies do behind the scenes, they have a technology platform. Um, you know, they have different ways to mitigate risk. Maybe they have in-house manufacturing. Uh, maybe they're addressing in pain points that are very important that Wall Street analysts are overlooking or don't really fully understand. Uh, so we'd probably argue that the way it was done in the past was very inefficient, right? I absolutely agree. Um, you know, uh, back in the day, I definitely you know, did some research into that where I was thinking, okay, well, platform technology companies, they have some value and their valuation um, at the time would not necessarily reflect that, as you said. So I think now we're definitely in a different era um, where we have, uh, even though it's based on platform technologies and very interesting and compelling uh, stories and different modalities for therapeutics, for example, just now the valuations, they, they flip to the other side. Yeah, I think the pendulum swung where before it was inefficient because, you know, maybe Wall Street analysts were out of their league. They didn't really understand what was going on. And now it's inefficient, but because companies are getting crazy valuations where they haven't really earned it, they haven't really deserved it. Um, so the risk here is that there's a lot of upside potential being priced in, whether that's good news that investors are expecting to come out or great clinical results that haven't been delivered yet. Uh, mm -hmm. It's already being priced into the stock now. So if you buy now and then you're buying into the story and it doesn't work out, that story fades. Well, you know, some of these companies could fall quite a bit. Uh, we might see some pretty sharp drops and corrections uh, if these stories fall apart. So we want to help you avoid some of these and just provide more objective information about some of the companies that we get questions asked about to us individually on Twitter or on the live show here at 7investing, which is 7investing now. Uh, you know, we want to provide objective information so that you're not just falling into some of these traps. So what we have, we have a handful of companies. We're going to introduce each one and talk about why it's potentially an intriguing story, why people are interested in it. Uh, and then we're going to talk about maybe some things that FinTwit is missing, right? Things that aren't getting pointed out uh, in the 280 characters you have for a tweet. You ready, Manisha? Let's get going. All right. So first up is a company in my neck of the woods, Amaris. Amaris is an industrial biotech company. So that means it's engineering microbes, right? It feeds them agri agricultural sugars as a carbon source. And then it uses those engineered microbes uh, as tiny factories to produce higher value chemicals, right? Uh, so the company today has a market valuation of $4.2 billion, which is, I think, close to an all-time high for its market valuation. Uh, and it's gained 440% since October 1st, 2020. 
So it's definitely a story stock. It's definitely has some momentum behind it. Um, now, what makes this an intriguing story? So Amherst does have great technology, right? Uh, it has a good platform technology. You can engineer microbes relatively efficiently, test them out at pilot scale, move those up the chain and eventually to commercial scale, hopefully. Um, you know, it has tremendous amount of chemical diversity, the different chemicals that it can make uh, through its metabolic engineering, um, you know, pathways that it uh, understands very well is, is very intriguing. It also has a handful of consumer brands. So it's taken some of the ingredients that it's made and, you know, some of those are really good moisturizers, Manisha, you might like those. <laughs> So they're uh, for you to uh, make my anti-aging moisturizer here, Max. That's an inside joke between us about uh, a DIY bio lab I had previously about, uh, it was a cosmetic company. But Amherst actually has cosmetic companies, not just in their spare bedroom. These are legit on the market making revenue now. So they have cosmetics, personal care brands, and, and so on. And those offer high growth, high margin revenue. So on paper, this looks great, right? Um, it has these opportunities ahead of it. And it issues press releases and investor presentations. It makes it look like this story is amazing and it's an amazing growth opportunity. Some things that FinTwit is probably missing. A lot, actually. So the company's on pace to lose over $150 million from operations in 2020. And this company routinely loses hundreds of millions of dollars from operations each and every year. I think it had a record operating loss in 2019 and it might do that again in 2020. So this business is losing more money as it scales. That's not what you wanna see as an investor. Uh, a bigger red flag in my mind, and Manisha, I know you care a lot about management teams and the people behind the business. And, and that is that Amherst has really been mismanaged for a number of years. Um, the CEO is just not really executed very well and he's continuously over-promised and under-delivered. Um, you know, if you look back in 2019, in April 2019, the business told investors it was going to have $850 million in annual revenue in 2021, which is this year. And it's not going to come close to that. It's not going to have half of that. It might not even have a third of that this year. Uh, and the company at that time also said it was going to have $1.3 billion in annual revenue in 2022. It's not going to come close to that either. Okay. So it's continuously missed its own projections. It's just set this high bar that's impossible to meet. Um, so I would caution investors, everything it says looks great, but it's always looked great. And the company has rarely met its own expectations or guidance. Um, so again, it has some interesting opportunities. I've been arguing for years, even directly with the company, that it should be investing, all, it should go all in on its consumer brands. Those are high margin, high growth opportunities. It doesn't need manufacturing facilities for those necessarily. Um, and it's only just coming around to those and it's still not shedding some of the more inefficient parts of its business, which are these big, high volume bulk ingredients that it sells to other companies. Uh, so it should go all in on consumer brands. Uh, so my takeaway here, the actionable insight for investors that are being led astray by FinTwit. Yes, this is a momentum play. It looks cool when you've made, you know, 440% in four or five months. But look, industrial biotech, it is a real opportunity. In fact, I think uh, industrial biotech generates more revenue today for the U.S. economy than biopharmaceuticals. And that's not something that many people would, would think about, right? Um, but look, there's a lot of next generation industrial biotech companies that are out there. Most of them are privately held, but I would say, wait for those. There's much better businesses, much better managed businesses, much better growth opportunities. Uh, and you're not missing out on anything by trying to rush into a position here uh, with Amaris. So next up on our list is a company, Manisha, that you know well, and that would be BioNanogenetics. Yes. So um, I think BioNano, it was towards the end of December or no, yeah, around Christmas time, um, Twitter was going nuts, FinTwit was going nuts, um, talking about this, well, before then, company that was not known at all, really. Uh, it was very under the radar, based in San Diego. And uh, so they are a laboratory hardware uh, and software tools developer. Um, it is also another SPAC. Um, and this was through Longview. Uh, their main technology is called Sapper. And the, currently the company has a market valuation of $3.2 billion. Um, and just you know, for full disclosure, um, I, I, do, 
I do own shares of this company. Um, you know, I was in there kind of earlier on before the stock gained uh, 2000 or 2,120% 2, uh, gains in just three months. So, I mean, yes, am I a happy investor? Sure. But I also realize that everyone makes mistakes. Um, I realize that's not necessarily usually how I invest. So um, it, it happens. Um, everyone falls into certain traps, especially when you are really excited about uh, a company that you haven't heard about. Um, well, even then, so this is important to point out, like you bought in at a much lower price. We won't say what it was, but it was way lower than what it's at today, right? And it was maybe... Yeah, at that valuation, it might have made sense. And you're also going to hold it for a long period of time, right? You're a long-term investor. But people that are buying it now at a valuation of, you know, $3.2 billion, or it's at like 440 times sales, yeah, you're going to be waiting a while to see a return. You might never see a return. So there is a difference there between, you know, you saw it as an opportunity before it kind of took off and blew up and people who are chasing momentum. Exactly. And that's something that, um, is very important to point out is that you should never be chasing stocks. And once, you know, once it's, you know, completely overvalued, getting in at the wrong time will only give you further losses in the future. So I think timing is very critical. Um, but why, why did I buy it uh, when it was at much cheaper valuation? So it's a cytogenomics company, um, which Cytogenomics, for those of you who don't know, it's looking at genomic variations and uh, structural variations in your DNA. Um, it has a, so compared to current ways of doing cytogenomics, um, it has a 10,000 X resolution versus uh, the current standard karyotyping. And what's also interesting, and I think this is what really helped the company uh, blow up so quickly is that there were a ton of press releases and studies that the company released, basically maybe even unfairly um, uh, comparing themselves to a DNA sequencing company, specifically PacBio. And in that press release, they said, hey, PacBio only gets 72% of structural, uh, uh, structural uh, variants compared to what PathBio is able to do using long read sequencing. And not only that, that um, BioNano's hardware tools and diagnostic system, it's less than five, it only costs less than $500 compared to, you know, a couple of thousands of dollars. So that is really interesting, but there's also that's missing um, uh, when it comes to what is missing in FinTech. So what, is hard for people to understand, especially if you don't dig in deep enough, is that it's still not a replacement to DNA-based sequencing. For example, at current valuations, they cannot detect uh, point mutations. So it's a there are different types of point mutations you can have in DNA and uh, in when, when it comes to genetic testing or genetic testing, genetic diseases, uh, there are different types and ways that your DNA can morph. Um, structural variation is just how the DNA forms when it divides, uh, when cells divide. Very, very unique and uh, very unique and niche area that um, they are focused on. And actually in my mind, um, I think it's a complement to DNA sequencing. I know a lot of DNA sequencing companies um, took a hit uh, when the press release uh, was released uh, from BioNano. So I think that really uh, makes a difference. And I know you have a few claims here as well, uh, Max. Yeah, I mean, those are, that's important to point out. It's more of a supplement to DNA sequencing. I mean, a lot of these uh, DNA sequencing platforms, you know, have different ways, I guess, usually through chemistry or software, or both uh, to detect structural variants. And, you know, to get the finest detail, you do need to use sequencing. Uh, you probably can't use this optical mapping system. Um, so, you know, I'm more focused on the valuation here of what, FinTwit's missing. So look, this company's valued at 440 times trailing 12 month sales. That's ridiculous, people. I mean, you know, in, in the previous market, a hardware company would never be valued anywhere close to that, right? But let's just say BioNano eventually has $100 million uh, in annual revenue. Okay, that's still trading at 30 times sales. That's way higher than any lab hardware company should ever realistically be valued at. Uh, and that's actually like, pretty high historically for a software company. 
if you wanted to argue that that's where Byron Nano's business model is going to go. Uh, so definitely be careful here. I think what's happening here is probably a lot of people playing the momentum, right? It kind of goes up by double digits all the time. Um, and I don't think that's very sustainable. Um, you know, and that's important too. We're having this discussion about FinTwit and what it's not telling you. So none of these companies necessarily, we're not saying they're going to fail tomorrow. We're not saying they're bad businesses. They don't have anything going for them, right? We're trying to be objective here. Um, but it is possible to overpay for a good business. It's possible to overpay for growth. So just keep that in mind. You know, if you're buying this at this price, uh, you might be waiting quite a while to see any return, right? The next company to talk about is Dermtech. This is actually a very, like one of the favorite companies here of, uh, of social media lately. Uh, so Dermtech a genetic testing company focused on skin diseases and uh, its initial products focused on diagnosing melanoma from suspicious uh, pigmented lesions, otherwise known as moles. I'm covered in moles. Nobody knows because Simon makes me wear a shirt every time I'm on video here. We'll have to talk with him about that policy. <laughs> so uh, Dermtech has a market valuation of $1.9 billion. And I had a tweet months ago saying, wow, this is at $250 million. I don't know. This is crazy. So that aged very well. I'm glad I sent that tweet out. Um, but its stock has gained 490% in just the last three months. Again, this is a big momentum play. So what makes this company intriguing? Well, I've had some close calls with melanoma actually, and uh, I can appreciate what the company's trying to do. So it takes a little piece of uh, a little proprietary tape it has, and it can peel off a layer of the mole and then send that in for you know, genetic analysis. Uh, so it's much less invasive than a, a typical biopsy. Uh, I have a couple scars on me from biopsies that were nothing. Uh, and those are some of my biggest scars I have. So I would appreciate not having scars. So something like this is exactly, I can appreciate it. Um, you know, and the company has a, a pipeline of other things it's working on outside of melanoma and other skin diseases, right? So this is an area that's really underserved right now uh, from genetic testing services. But what is FinTwit missing? Part of the objective pieces of information here. Um, you know, look, the path to success, and Manish, you can weigh in here too, in genetic testing, you're, you're successful by scale. You need to have a high volume of tests, throughput, labs, you need to have high quality data, and you need to have low costs, right? Um, not to get too far into the history of genetic testing, but, you know, years ago it was Myriad Genetics, and they patented certain genes, which later the Supreme Court overturned and overruled, said you can't do that. Uh, but they patented genes, and they just sold a very small number of tests for a very high price, exorbitant price, some would say. And then other companies came along and said, no, 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 no. Look, this is how you win in genetic testing. You do it by selling as many tests as possible for the lowest price possible and also keeping quality high. Uh, so Mirror Genetics, of course, has been slagging in terms of, uh, lagging rather, in, <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know, getting catch up to that strategy and shifting its, its tactics there. Uh, it's, definitely, it's made some acquisitions and things like that, but We've seen newer players come along and, and do it better and maybe even start to become the leaders in this space. So for Dermtech, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. I, no, I just wanted to agree with you. And, and not only that, but another very important thing to think about is genetic testing is a very saturated area. There are just a whole host of companies. So um, like you said, Max, I think the the true winners will be kind of companies who have proven scale and are bringing low cost uh, genetic testing. And, you know, there are larger players who are trying to do that. And some of these players can, you know, basically just intermediate what Dermtech is doing. Um, once their platform gets there, once they realize um, detecting melanoma early or uh, doing genetic testing there is also important. So um, I think that's a very important point. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, one of the narratives here for Dermtech, well, it has a couple patents in these genes or uh, genetic markers that it looks for. And the reality is, even if you look beyond that Supreme Court decision with Myriad Genetics, uh, there have been a handful of other uh, legal decisions that have set a precedent in the United States where, um, you know, the National Institute of Health has actually said uh, patents for genes or genetic biomarkers are basically, you can't defend them. So if you come up for litigation, um, don't expect any help from us or the legal system because you're, you know, you're probably not going to find it. So the fact that Dermtech has a patent portfolio to me is almost worthless. Uh, it does have a patent for the tape that it uses, the adhesive patch. That expires. That's the soonest to expire patent that it owns. And there's other ways to do that, right? There's microneedle technology. 
but you can get other, you know, skin samples and things to process in your lab. Um, the company also has yet to really scale its business, right? In the last, I'm sorry, in the first nine months of 2020, it had $2.9 million in revenue from its genetic tests. That's it, $2.9 million. Uh, so the company has to sign up a lot more insurance companies to use its, its, uh, its tools, its products, and it is doing so. It's had a nice string of success lately, but I think there's a lot of success already being priced in to the current price. Um, you know, it's trading at uh, a couple hundred times revenue, 200 times revenue, 100 times revenue right now at these prices. So look, Dermtech can absolutely be successful. Maybe other scaled competitors don't want to get into uh, genetic testing of skin. Maybe they don't have labs that can handle those types of tissue samples, right? Um, but again, there's nothing stopping a scaled competitor from moving in here. And quite literally, they could just copy what Dermtech is doing. Um, at some level, there's almost no novelty to genetic testing, right? I mean, there's workflows and things for automation and how you handle samples in the lab, right? Liquid handling or using acoustic handling. Um, you've worked in labs as have I, we know all about that. Um, but you know, for the most part, there's nothing proprietary about processing a sample. Um, so if a, if a scale competitor moves into Dermatech's, uh, rather Dermtech's market, um, you know, that could be, that could very much change the storyline here, right? If it actually has competition and it's from a much bigger competitor, uh, I don't think investors are really factoring that in right now. So I would wait until the company proves successful, maybe a few quarters, is it actually scaling revenue? It can grow quite a bit and still be vastly overvalued, which I think is more likely to be the case. So the next company, actually the next two companies we have are companies again in genomics in your little area, um, CRISPR Therapeutics and also Editas Medicine. So let's take CRISPR Therapeutics yep. first, Venetia. All right, so CRISPR Therapeutics, what is it? It's a CRISPR gene editing <laughs> company. I will give them that. <laughs> they uh, they, they the definitely name. did really well. Yeah, they, they got it. Um, and they're focused on, um, well, Initially, they're focused on ex vivo applications, but they have uh, also started working on in vivo as well, which is great. Um, the company currently, uh, if you, especially if you compare it to um, all of the other uh, CRISPR-based, CRISPR gene editing-based companies, um, has really scaled quite quickly in terms of developing their pipeline, but also their market valuation is $10.5 billion. Uh, last year, the stock gained 161%, um, and it has recently sold off for um, you know uh, a bit. I think uh, from around 13 billion. Um, but if you look at their pipeline, there's still you know some questions on uh, valuation. But again, it's an intriguing story because from when they IPO'd, um, they have quickly scaled and developed their pipeline program. Um, for example, not only are they working CAR uh, therapy or kind of areas where uh, you can potentially treat diabetes, which we all know, especially in the U.S., that is a huge problem because we love our burgers and fries. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I mean, it, it's a it's a huge unmet need. So they've done really well, and I will say it's also an intriguing story because. I am impressed at how management has been able to enter multiple programs into their pipeline. They very early on secured large pharmaceutical companies. So it makes sense why a lot of people are excited. They're moving, they are moving very quickly. But what is Fintuit missing? I think there are num you know, we hear about CRISPR everywhere um, these days. Uh, you know, everyone's saying, you know, this is the gene editing tool of the future. This is going to bring us into the era, uh, the era of you know, curative medicines, and I know Max really hates that term, absolutely despises it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, especially when you compare it to peers, there are questions on, um, is it overvalued? And, you know, another uh, kind of issue that we should, or another, um, you know, thing we should be thinking about is, you know, it, it's still a very early, um, I guess, technology, that we know, you know a lot about, but we haven't really seen it long enough on the market to understand uh, what are the future, like the future safety issues. Um, I think it's important to get a commercial drug out before we get to 
you know, these valuations. Um, so, you know, there's that. And I know um, uh, Max here has some thoughts on, you know, genetic medicine and, you know, is CRISPR the end all be all for genetic medicines? What do you think? Yeah, I think of all the companies we're going to talk about here, um, you know, this one has the most um, mature data, which I guess isn't saying much, right? Was in still phase one, two, right? Yep. Um, but, you know, we, we've seen some good results, some durable responses insofar as how long these trials have been going on. Uh, but there are other companies out there trying to, you know, use genetic medicines to treat these blood conditions, right? Sickle cell and beta thalassemia. Um so is it possible that, you know, next generation therapies maybe do this less invasively? Um, I know there's, uh, it wasn't the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, bad timing on their part, but they just announced with Novartis uh, the funding of, you know, an initiative to find a, you know, single shot curative gene therapy for sickle cell disease. And they did that the day after <laughs> Bluebird Bio uh, paused its trials of gene therapy in sickle cell disease. So that was what the bad timing was about. Uh, but do you think something like that's possible? I mean, you're maybe more tuned into this space. and uh... Yeah, no, I think it's very possible. Um, the, I think the beauty of kind of new technology and research, um, we're seeing, I think CRISPR will definitely accelerate research in kind of wet labs, just understanding biology and potential, uh, potentially accelerating our development of new modalities of, you know, treating genetic diseases. Um, so I think it's very much possible. I mean, no one thought that there will be in 2012, that's when we will discover CRISPR gene editing. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's taking over the world and now no one else is looking at gene editing. And I mean, honestly, gene editing, like that concept has been around for decades. Um, it, it's, it's an old technology. It's just that over time, it's getting easier, faster and cheaper. Um, but there are also other gene editing modalities that people can use. And I'm sure, you know, in the future, maybe not in the next three or five years, but maybe in the next 10 years, there might be uh, a different way of um, editing the DNA that's also, or kind of different ways of doing it in a safer, more precise way. I think just over time, it's going to get better. Um, and then the other part is uh, going after, so there, so CRISPR therapeutics uh, lead indication, so, you know, sickle cell disease and uh, beta thalassemia. Again, uh, as Max said, amazing da uh, data, but then there's the question of how many other companies are working on that? Uh, and are all of these companies gonna have great data? So there's definitely gonna be competition on, well, whose drug will be used? So wh when you tie that to current valuations, that, that is an area that um, should be focused on. And I think FinTwit misses. And then lastly, and I know Max wrote a piece on this, it's, is first mover advantage really an advantage? So. Yeah, I think a couple of things, right? So that was a great discussion. Um, you know, I, I don't doubt that maybe we, maybe we rushed CRISPR tools into the clinic. Um, I still think some of these first generation CRISPR tools, uh, we don't really know a lot about, you know, how they're going to work. What are the long-term ramifications? You know, um, are we going to see things four or five years after clinical trials have completed that are worrisome safety signals? Um, if I try to use the power of future hindsight, right, I think we might look back and say, wow, making double-stranded breaks in the genome, which is what first-generation CRISPR does by and large. Uh, hey, that was a really bad idea. Man, that was stupid. We should have never done that. Like, I could see us totally coming to that conclusion. Um, so some of the hype right now in the market and these frothy valuations, you know, it's based on the stock market we're in at the macro level. Uh, and then there's different narratives about CRISPR gene editing. And you brought up a good point too, which is that I think a lot of the potential of CRISPR is maybe even outside of therapeutics, right? We can have much better diagnostics. We could have much better R and D tools, um, you know, editing cell lines and things like that. Um, you know, just understanding what genes are expressed when, uh, various things that no one really talks about that aren't really investing opportunities. Um, and that's, like a lot of the power of what CRISPR does because it's so cheap, it's so easy to use. Um, you know, so that's kind of outside of uh, the horizon of many investors at least. So I would agree with that. All right, the next company, Editas Medicine, we'll just keep with CRISPR. Um, so you wanna talk about this one as well. 
What is Fin Twit missing about Editas? What does Editas do? All right. All right, drum roll. It's another CRISPR company. <laughs> um, so again, I will say, um, you know, I've written a lot about CRISPR. Uh, I've written CRISPR white papers and whatnot. So I like, I love the technology. Um, I think it's uh, something that we needed. Um, but that's the other thing. There are peers and uh, there's going to be first generation, there's going to be uh, second generation CRISPR tools. So Editas uh, initially focused on ex vivo applications as well. Uh, they, their first uh, lead indication is for uh, LCA10, which is uh, basically pediatric uh, childhood blindness. And over time, um, unfortunately, these children do go blind. Um, and of course, that's terrible. And another reason why, you know, People would want, um, you know, people would pay for something like this if their their child can see again. Um, so they are in clinical trials. Um, we don't have too much data, but then again, that's this is not the only company that's working on LCA10. Uh, there are other companies using different modalities, so they're not the only ones in this market. And it's also not too common, and especially when you compare it to a market valuation of three point three billion dollars. Um, and that the stock has gained 112% the last year. Um, you, you have to question kind of the, the deep pipeline. So definitely an intriguing story, but what Fintech uh, is missing here, um, I would say is, well, a number of things. My biggest concern and the area that really drives me to invest in a company is having a solid and great management team. I don't know if I am comfortable that I can say that for Editas, the management churn has been just insane. Um, yeah, it was about, it right was, now we are. Oh, sorry. It was founded in 2000, November, 2013, and it's already on its third CEO. It lost its chief, chief scientific officer in January of this year. Um, I would say that's a little concerning for sure. Oh, and their chief financial officer actually left when it's first, basically within two months, um, well, it was first the chief financial officer and then within two months, the CEO left. The first CEO had left. Um, I think she might've even been ousted. It's, it's, there's some speculation there. But when you have management churn, that like so much management churn, um, you know, in, in a development stage uh, therapeutics company, you know, th there's not much stability. Um, and you, if you're transitioning new, um, executive, a new C-suite uh, 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 people in to help develop and grow the pipeline and bring it forward. I'm sure there's plenty of delays, um, but then it also begs the question, you know, what's what's under the hood? Um, why, why is there so much turnover? What's happening? So I think that that's something that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Um, obviously, everyone has a different opinion on management team, and and maybe their current management team is going to be even better than um, when they first uh, IPO'd. Um, that remains to be seen. Um, but I think you know again what we've said about other uh, you know therapeutics companies and whatnot um, relative to the data that's been presented is three point three billion dollar market capitalization. Um, does, does that make sense? Um, you know, I, I personally think, you know, might be, um, Max, do you have anything to say here? Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, certainly I think the CRISPR space in general might be a little frothy, right? Some of those companies might deserve it more than others. They have better data or different, you know, delivery tech or something. Um, but yeah, you know, we saw Editas Medicine stock jump on some of the ash data and it has an in vivo sickle cell approach, right? But it was preclinical data. It looked pretty good as far as preclinical data goes, but uh, important thing for investors to remember, everything that moves into the clinic has very good preclinical data. And that's why it moves into the clinic in the first place. Um, so just, you know, it's still super early for this. Um, you know, and another thing, this applies to CRISPR therapeutics as well. Most of the humans, on planet Earth that have these traits or sickle cell disease or beta thalassemia don't live in the United States. You know, they live in Spain or Portugal or Mediterranean countries or in Africa. And there's actually a population in India. Um, you know, those are places that aren't going to be paying $2 million a year 
or for a cure, right? Or a, a cure, I should say in, in yeah. quotes, because I don't like that word, um, you know, but for these durable treatments. So when you're pricing these companies based on potentially having, you know, this very great treatment for some of these diseases, um, well, how, you know, it, how I think it's 70 or 80% of the patient population is outside of the United States. They're not going to pay these prices. Uh, I think you have to factor that in as well to some of the valuations here. So, um, yeah, I think you actually brought up a great point uh, in terms of where are these patients, because then the next thing you have to think about is these are all, you know, these are CRISPR companies developing first generation kind of uh, treatments for sickle cell and beta thalassemia. But is there going to become a company that is able to figure out a more scalable way of making edits that will actually be cheaper? And um, I mean, right now, they're, you know, they're pricing in uh, kind of a one and done treatment paradigm. So, you know, that gives it a premium, but also the R&D that goes into it. But, you know, there's a potential that, I mean, even if it's not using CRISPR, maybe it's just using a different gene editing or genetic medicine kind of approach that um, could be cheaper, which would disintermediate their commercialized drug if they get commercialized. Yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously we're here in the United States, we price all of our companies based on our crazy market for, you know, pricing drugs, but uh, that's <laughs> certainly an outlier for the rest of the world. So you have to keep that in mind as well, especially for genetic diseases where, you know, the populations of people that have these mutations is not all in the United States, right? It's, it's dispersed all across the globe. All right, the next company, it looks like our last company here is another one from my neck of the woods, Jivo. Jivo, just like Bio Nano, Genomics was a penny stock not very long ago, had a very low market valuation. It was actually trading uh, below a dollar not that long ago. Um, so Jivo is an industrial biotech company. <clears throat> it's working on what it calls a renewable hydrocarbon platform. Uh, so similar to Amherst, it's taking engineered microbes, feeding them uh, agricultural sugars and other low cost um, you know, carbon sources. It uses those microbes as tiny little factories to produce higher value chemicals. Right now, Jivo has a market valuation of $1.8 billion and it's gained 760% in the last three months. Quite obviously a pretty good momentum play and, and certainly good for day traders. Of course, that's not what we do here at 7 Investing. We're about long-term investing. So what makes this company an intriguing story? You know, I've covered this for almost a decade now. And on paper, you know, the company's platform could be used to retrofit ethanol facilities to produce higher value chemicals, right? Namely, isobutanol. Uh, so the nation, the United States has, I think it's over 16 billion gallons of ethanol manufacturing capacity, but ethanol is a very low margin product. Uh, it's actually been trading at some of the lowest prices in the last uh, 18 months that it's ever traded at. Um, now, isobutanol, on the other hand, is a higher value carbon chemical than ethanol. Uh, so in chemistry class, many of you maybe remember this, but uh, we have this little acronym of monkeys eat purple bananas. So that stands for, do, do you remember that? Do you ever hear that in chemistry yeah, class? I remember that, but I don't remember it, sadly, um, <laughs> what it stands for. So please tell me. All right, maybe they didn't teach that at Stanford. But in my state school in New York, they taught it to us. So uh, monkeys eat purple bananas, and that stands for methanol ethanol, propanol, and then butanol. And each one has another carbon atom, right? Methanol is one, ethanol is two carbon atoms. Um, propanol has three carbon atoms and butanol has four carbon atoms. So in general, the more carbon atoms it has, the higher value it is, the more difficult it is to make, but it has better chemical properties usually. So Jivo is looking to upgrade its isobutanol production platform into renewable gasoline and renewable jet fuel. So it's going to use, you know, agricultural sugar, sugars, make isobutanol, and then there's another processing step to turn it into these renewable hydrocarbons. Uh, so these are drop-in replacements to existing infrastructure. So that's a, a bonus in terms of what the company is trying to do. Uh, a lot of talk recently, and I think this has a lot to do with its recent run-up. You know, a lot of people are talking about the new Biden administration, and it's going to be a huge tailwind for companies like Jivo, right? Uh, in fact, one of the company's scientific founders, Francis Arnold, is on Biden's science team. Uh, so Frances Arnold won the Nobel Prize for her discovery of directed evolution of enzymes um, back in, I don't know, I don't remember what year that was. I didn't write it down, but it's, you know, within the last 20 years. Um, you know, and that's been an important advance for synthetic biology. And she also grew up in Pittsburgh, so I'm a big fan of hers. 
Now, what is FinTwit missing, right? So that's on paper, it all looks great. In reality, renewable fuels require a crazy amount of scale to be economically viable. And sometimes they still aren't economically viable, even at massive scale. I mean, look at ethanol, for instance. Uh, so this was actually one of the first lessons that next generation industrial biotech learned, and it learned it the hard way. You know, in the late 2000s, oil prices were through the roof. They hit record prices per barrel. And that was really this coming out moment for industrial biotech. There were companies trying to, you know, make giant concrete runways in the desert and turn algae into oil and all kinds of crazy stuff going on. A lot of those companies don't exist anymore because they looked at these giant markets and they were measured in trillions of dollars. What they failed to look at was the margins on those products, which were close to zero. You're also competing with petroleum and petrochemical infrastructure as a hundred year head start on industrial biotech. So it's very difficult to compete with those scales uh, and those economics. Another thing to point out here, you know, Jiva has been wisely taking advantage of its recent uh, run up and, you know, it's been promoting its net zero one project, which is a, uh, it's kind of taking a, a page out of Tesla's book, right? Tesla has the gigafactories and it names them accordingly. So Jivo now is net zero facilities it wants to build. And net zero one is going to produce about 45 million gallons per year of jet fuel and diesel fuel. It's going to make 158 metric tons of animal feed, which is not a lot. Uh, it's going to have net zero carbon emissions. So for this 45 million gallon per year facility, it's going to cost about $750 million. That is an insane cost for this facility. And yes, it's first of its kind. I'm not even sure it'll be economically viable, but I think they're using it more as a blueprint for saying, hey, look, we can do this. Now let's go build, you know, uh, a giant world-class scale facility, right? Hundreds of millions of gallons per year. And they're trying to use it for that reason. But again, um, this technology currently is not economically viable. I'm not sure this is really the, uh, the time to be pursuing uh, renewable liquid fuels, right? The, the future of transportation and fuels is not liquid. It's probably electricity. Uh, and I think, you know, the trajectory of electric vehicles, um, they're going to take off way faster than even the most optimistic projections currently call for. That's my inkling. You know, we're, we're constantly underestimating renewable energy. And I think we're going to do the same for electric vehicles. Um, you know, so that's going to take over trucking, heavy duty trucking. It's going to take over passenger vehicles, um, pickup trucks. I think, you know, 10 years from now, the market's going to look quite a bit different. So I think that obviously saps some of the market for what Jivo is trying to do. So again, my, you know, takeaway here and the insight or the action, actionable insight I would have for investors. Um, yes, you're right. Industrial biotech is great. I mean, I majored in it, right? Cause I'm really smart. Um, unfortunately you have to wait a little bit longer. There's a lot of really cool next generation companies out there, but most of them are privately held. Uh, so I would just say, wait for those. There's, there's great companies with great products, great man, management teams. They can actually, you know, have profitable products and, and tons of growth. And they're making really cool things. They're making, um, you know, new, new ways to make materials for apparel or building materials. Uh, there's a company that's making um, coatings that help deflect radar for stealth fighter jets. We're doing that with industrial biotech. So there's a lot of really cool opportunities, much more interesting than making low margin fuels. So don't have fear of missing out. You're definitely not missing out on any of that. All right. So Manisha, I think that wraps up our short little discussion here of uh, what FinTwit isn't telling you about certain stocks. And again, we want to be objective. We're not trying to, um, you know, say any of these companies are going to fail tomorrow or that they don't have ways that they can succeed. I think we laid out a case for each one where they can, can succeed. Um, but important to keep in mind a couple different things, right? You know, unlike companies in other industries, you have in living technology and biotech, you know, these early stage drug developers or early stage industrial biotech companies, a lot of times they don't have revenue or earnings to insulate them from risk, right? So if one company, it's a SaaS company has a bad day or they miss an earnings report or something, you know, yeah, they might fall 10% here and there, right? It might have a little volatility. Um, but when a company like the ones we've talked about that really gain on stories, when that story falls apart, there's nothing there to insulate it from a extreme volatility. So I wouldn't be surprised if some of these companies you've talked about and many more that are kind of become story stocks here in early 2021 fall by, you know, 40% or 50% or even more uh, before the end of 2021. And the second thing I would point out to everyone is that it's important to seek out information, not confirmation. 
Manisha, I'm sure your DMs look way worse than mine. But, uh, you know, we get, we get people reach out to us and even through info at seven investing, or we get questions on seven investing now our live show. Um, you know, people want us to, they, they, they ask about a, a certain stock. Hey, what do you think of this? And it's our job to provide objective information. And we do that. And every once in a while, somebody will fire back or, you know, reply. And it's almost as if they want to argue with some of the points we've brought up, you know, and, and it's kind of frustrating, um, you know, every company has strengths and weaknesses and challenges and opportunities. So don't just, when you're doing your research, don't look at opportunities uh, for investing in your portfolio with rose colored glasses, right? Every company has things that are unflattering. You got to take the good with the bad, right? Um, and you're trying to navigate those risks. That's what investing is. It's not about, you know, casting aside all the bad information and uh, thinking everything's going to go to the moon because usually those things are not very sustainable. Right. And then also it's, we're not saying, you know, don't look at stocks, don't look at the conference, uh, the compensation and fin to it. Um, you know, there's always great discussions there. And, you know, sometimes, um, you know, there might be a great company that, you know, is, someone is talking about on fin to it, but it's just a matter of don't buy it just because someone is talking about it on social media. I think, you know, it's a great place for a starting point for research, you know, take that company, do your own due diligence, look at where the current valuations are and then ask yourself, does this make sense? Um, I think that's kind of my takeaway. Yeah, exactly. And, and there's a lot of great companies that are out there and sometimes they're just at the wrong price. So maybe you can just wait. There's better opportunities uh, at any point in the market. So make sure you're aware of that. All right. So that wraps up our, this edition anyway, of the uh, seven investing podcast. And uh, you know, we're going to do this more regularly once a month, maybe Manisha will, uh, focus exclusively on some biotech topic and nerd out? Oh, um, I'm always down uh, for nerding out in biotech. You know that. <laughs> All right. I like it. Like I said at the top, my partner in crime, Anisha Sammy. All right. So we will see you guys next week. Take care.